people who are burning out, including myself, are often the last people to know that they're burning out. And that was a real wake up call. Eight out of 10 employees are actually looking at what does the company offer in terms of mental health support and resources before they even consider a job opportunity. <laughs> I really often wonder, are, are we doing enough there? How do I wanna help people get through the hard parts of life? This is a tool that enables that. Today's guest ended up in hospital with a burnout. It was very difficult, but also what propelled him to become a well-being activist. In today's episode, Nathan Yandres will share his journey, why companies should focus on well-being and lots of tips for you and your team to improve the well-being and mental health at work. Stay tuned. Nathan, how did you become a well-being activist? It's a personal story. It's one I talk about uh, often. You know, 2019 was a really rough year, maybe the worst year of my life up to that point. I had several people die in my life, and the grief and the heaviness of that uh, was underestimated. I nearly lost my little dog. She was in a terrible accident and nearly died. Uh, I was having some trouble at work. I was actually starting to be overly stressed. If we look at 2019, it was also, I was living in Hong Kong during the protests. And this was also a, a major source of distraction and, and stress for me. And I ultimately ended up uh, in the hospital with kidney problems and the, the weight of all of what I call the, the stacks uh, of adversity sitting right on top of me uh, and it nearly broke me. Um, you know, it was causing problems uh, at work. It was causing problems at home. The stress ultimately led to burnout. You know, burnout is a real thing. Burnout actually is a slow churn and, and it's why they call it burn. You slowly burn down to when there's nothing there anymore and you're out. <laughs> and people who are burning out, including myself, are often the last people to know that they're burning out. And that was a real wake up call, you know, to go into the hospital, have these problems, my, my body was breaking down. My mental and emotional energies were, were empty. And what I found was that my spiritual energy, purpose, was completely missing. And purpose for me was far over on this other side to, to, to what I was actually doing and experiencing. So for me, it was about a recalibration of all those things. Um, and and it's, it, it only fueled my, my passion to get out there and start helping others to tap into how do you get through life's really hard things? How do you face into and lean into life's adversities? Because the one thing that is constant is change. It's never going to go away. From the time we're born to the time we die, change is always happening. So what are the tools then? What are my tools? How do I help people do that? Uh, and, and that's the birthplace of where this activism came from. Mm. So you, you mentioned something very interesting that uh, normally with burnout, we are the, the, the last people <laughs> to know it. Mm -hmm. When was the moment that you understood that, oh my God, there's something serious happening? I think it was, you know, in, in the moment at the hospital where, where no one came to visit. I had isolated myself. And I recognized that only I could have to deal with this. It was my problem and my problem al alone. But that I had isolated in the, in the process of burning out all of the, the, the community of support and my chosen family. And I hadn't forgiven myself for some things. I hadn't dealt with some of the grief. It was also starting therapy. You know, I'm a massive advocate of open dialogue on having therapists and psychologists and counselors and coaches in your life because that's an investment. And that investment that I made in myself was one where I was able to then recognize through, through the work that I did with my therapist, energy positive, energy negative activities. And we needed to turn that around. And so if you do an energy audit, you know, with yourself, then you're going to be able to see where you're putting your time uh, and how you're spending your energy. Mm. 
Thank you for sharing your personal story. I think it's so important that we, we share our stories and we, we inspire others because we all go through difficult moments, yeah. right? And if we now go into the workplace, to, we talk a lot about well-being. Let's first get on everyone on the same page. Yeah. What is well-being for you at the workplace? Let's start with a, a really interesting statistic, okay? 92% of employees have mental health issues that impact their work, okay? So when we talk about creating well-being in the workplace, it just can't be a, a, a post-COVID or a COVID buzzword anymore. We really need to create culture, and this is where my activism starts to, to shine up and to get passionate about well-being in the workplace. We need to create culture. Well, what is culture? Well-being culture is rituals and habits and language and dialogue and customs and practices around well-being. When we create a space for people that is safe and that is a comfortable place, when we think about uh, all of the dimensions of well-being, we've got emotional and occupational and environmental and physical and spiritual and financial well-being, all of these things show up for the, for the person who comes through your door to work. So we need to ensure that the workplace is a culture of enabling people to be their whole self when they show up. I, I heard a couple years ago at another place I worked, and I've been borrowing this, this phrase, you know, when life works, work works. The whole person shows up. And you know, I said it was in my background before, you know, I, I trained in the, in the Jesuit tradition uh, of education, cura personalis is Latin for care for the whole person. When we take a holistic approach and we think about all those well-being dimensions and we think about the person that comes through the door, if we're thinking about those things then if, and we're thinking about when, when life works for our people, then the work part can work even better. And I don't think employees or, or employers are thinking enough about how the whole person shows up. Employers often think, oh, they just, you know, work. That's the only thing that these people do is, is they, they live to work. No, no. People also you know, work to live, and we need to make sure that that's a very balanced approach. So creating a culture from the very beginning is, is fundamental. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting what you say. Um, so let, let's say if an employee uh, is going through a really tough time at home, let's say a divorce or a financial problem, like, um, what do you think is the responsibility of the company in, in that personal um, issue? Or where, where's the line between the, the, the responsibility of the company and the employee? Yeah, this is also an interesting statistic, right? 81% of, of employees believe that the workplace is responsible for mental health. And we know from the American Psychology Association that eight out of 10 employees are actually looking at what does the company offer in terms of mental health support and resources before they even consider a job opportunity. So when we think about whose responsibility is it, uh, I think it's a shared one, okay? And employees have rights, you know, to, to have safe environments where they can be productive. But in, in employers, it, you know, workplaces need to, to consider, you know, how they build those, those workspaces. I think that the duty of care for managers is a real thing. And managers, you know, they're not trained psychologists. You know, they're not going to be counselors or coaches, you know, professional, because uh, their job is to lead and, and manage business and, and drive results. But I think what we also have to do is make sure that the duty of care uh, of which managers are responsible is something that, that comes alive and is, is brought to, to fruition. It's, it becomes a reality and, and creates that culture. And duty of care really is about human stuff. You know, I, I was just telling my team yesterday that <laughs> like, a big part of our job as HR, human resources uh, leaders, is to help people be more human. And what we mean by that is, you know, bringing empathy, listening, asking good probing questions, keeping space for silence, reflection, and dedicating enough time for that employee and manager to kind of be in relationship and be in a space where they can work through potential issues or identify issues that then can be signposted or given extra resource. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we mean by duty of care. 
I don't know how we are doing in that space. I, I often wonder, <laughs> I really often wonder, are, are we doing enough there? You know, have we trained and selected managers in the right way? Have we also, as HR people, looked at putting well-being in the center of jobs and job design and role design and team design and, and looking at how well-being can be at the center of that? I've said many times, you know, well-being is the birthplace of diversity, inclusion, and equity. It is where if you show up and you feel good and your workplace is also diverse and inclusive and there's a sense of belonging, then you're, you're going to want to be there. All of these things fit together. And I think leaders, managers um, have that duty of care to, to look after all of those things. And that's why I'm saying we start with culture first and we build a well-being culture from the inside then those things naturally occur, and they become the expectation, not just the, not just the rule. Mm. And in, in that journey of, of managers, uh, uh, what do you see, what are the biggest challenges that you see managers having in that journey? A lot of managers believe that you know, there, there's mental health issues and mental illness is you know, not in their workplace. Not true. 30% of employees actually miss work due to mental health issues. Mm. 17% of CEOs actually miss work because of mental health issues. So we've got to help managers and leaders understand that actually we all have mental health. <laughs> we all have it. We, there's no escaping it. And, but what we, we need to think about is changing that narrative. And what I'd like to, to you know, emphasize or encourage uh, managers and leaders to think about uh, as we change the narrative and kind of debunk some of those those myths is what if we think about mental health as mental wealth and we use the tools of investment in ourselves not just to think about fixing things that are broken but actually going out and investing in our portfolio of living more fully. If we can flip the narrative of mental health on its head in the workplace where people spend most of their time, yeah. then we're actually going to be able to affect change. And I would tell you from having gone through you know, therapy sessions and counseling and have hired coaches for my life, mm -hmm. that it makes a, a massive difference. It might be the greatest investment that you can make in yourself. So if we start talking about mental health as mental wealth and start investing in that, like we do our financial portfolios, we can actually then live an amazing life filled with exciting, joyful moments um, that enable us to kind of live fully and ideally chase into purpose and, and live the higher meaning of things. Yeah. Yeah. But how do you think we can prepare managers for that? Because yeah. it's huge. So we need a lot of uh, people skills, right? A lot of uh, empathy, understanding yeah. people. How can we bring that into our managers so that they are able to build that environment that you mentioned where we care about people and we, we help people to be more human? Yeah, I think that part of it comes from training. Mm. Um, and I also think part of it comes from bringing shared and lived experiences to the workplace. So let me talk about what I mean. I think one of the ways to, to help managers learn is to put out some, some big taboo topics uh, out into the space where intersectional crossroads you know, get tricky and uncomfortable. And as an activist, that's where we want to be. We want people to, to lean into that uncomfortability so that they can learn something. And bringing taboo topics, I'll give you a good example, as an LGBTQ leader, an out and proud LGBTQ leader, you know. We're not talking about LGBTQ issues in this part of the world, right? And we're also really afraid of talking about mental health issues uh, in this part of the world because of the stigma and, and, and some of the beliefs around what, what mental health is and isn't. But I, I said, baloney, let's put mental health and LGBTQ in the same conversation. Because guess what? LGBTQ people, particularly in Asia Pacific and in Asia, have a unique experience with their mental health in the workplace. Let's blow that up. Let's create a conversation so that people can learn from real people. We put a panel of LGBTQ people, Asian, sitting in this part of the world, on a, a conversation, a dialogue about their own mental health journeys in the workplace. Fascinating. 
But what happened is, is we were actually able to bring awareness, education, realism, an open conversation, and slowly you can help pick and pull apart some of the, the misconceptions yeah. that managers and leaders have and, and then recognize, oh, we actually we do have you know, people who are challenged with you know, mental health things that I never thought about. Mm -hmm. And we did the same thing around menopause. No one wants to talk about menopause. And I'm a massive advocate of, of putting more conversation around menopause. Uh, you know, we have the, the world's population uh, who are going to go through this natural event. Why aren't we talking about that? And it's a taboo topic. We can blow these topics up by bringing lived experiences and then help leaders and managers learn, but then also start to adopt this culture of care. And, and then the second part of this answer is really what, what should we be doing in, in terms of um, skills training? It, it really is about you know, doing what we did at my company um, most recently was uh, how to have the well-being conversation training. You know, we got executives from the very top um, to co-sponsor a session where we trained all of our people managers around the world in how to have a well-being conversation with your employees. And it included you know, some real basic tools that we use every day, like listening, probing questions, thinking about empathy, bringing empathy and space to, to your employee, but also how to build trust. It comes from building, you know, using this beautiful trust formula that that's out, out there in the coaching world, and you know, allowing managers to practice. These conversations are actually not that difficult because when we're being human, you know, and we're thinking about people in a human way, you know, as a fellow human being, then we're able to, you know, create good practices where people can feel safe and have those conversations, and, and ultimately, hopefully, get the help that they need. Mm. So this is such a huge topic, which is um, a lot of times uh, people don't open up mm. about their mental health issues at work. This is sometimes because of stigma or um, uh, fear of negative consequences. Mm. And this is huge, so uh, people don't, cannot open up about this. How do we debunk these myths in order to, so that people can openly share about their mental health issues? And how can managers support them? Yeah, I think, as I was saying before, I, I might be repeating myself, as you know, debunking the myths is really about bringing awareness yeah. and educating leaders and managers about truths and facts. You know, and, and I, I think I said before, you know, the, the statistics are, are alarming. Um, when we look at all of the mental health issues in the workspace, I think the World Health Organization said it's about one trillion US dollars that affects the global economy from lost productivity. So when we start with that kind of metric, and you're talking to leaders, and we're talking to managers, and we're talking to the C-suite, you know, you want competitive advantage in your business, or do you want to lose it? Then we need to be thinking about how do we educate our leaders and our managers around, you know, creating yeah. really great spaces. Spaces yeah. that thrive. Mm. Spaces where people can be super productive, be resilient and also be themselves so that they bring their best ideas and innovation and thinking and productivity to the workplace, mm. right? But as I said before, you know, we all have mental health and we're all gonna ride up and down life's challenges because that's life. Mm. Um, and as the intersectionality of adversities, you know, cross sect in, in various ways and shapes as they do in, in our day-to-day -day life, mm. Um, as I was getting ready today, you know, I cut myself shaving. You know, like, <laughs> what am I going to do? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. We, we have these moments where we just need to, to move on. And that's where I think teaching resilience, helping leaders and all people get clear on who they are, having values-based conversations, creating values-based uh, workspaces mm -hmm. that are authentic and psychologically safe for people, then enable our leaders to kind of get a better view of how productivity can look in the future. Yeah. I think also what's happening today, a lot of 
times uh, leaders don't know the size of the problem mm -hmm. in their company. Yeah. And you, 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 in our previous conversation, you mentioned one of your stories in Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, where you organized a session yeah. and suddenly the, the, there were more people uh, uh, interested about that topic than new thoughts. Yeah. Can you tell us about that story and what were the insights that you got from there? Yeah, well, it came from that space where I, I was in that suffering, uh, as I mentioned, in 2019, and I recognized I, I can't, certainly can't be the only one suffering alone. What can I do about that? And so I organized. Um, an opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about well-being, and there was a, uh, a gentleman from one of our, our partnerships that that also was championing, you know, mental health talks and and things like this. And so we collaborated and we created uh, a space where we were able to watch a, a film about depression, screen the film, and then have have a, a talk back. And I I thought I don't know if anyone's going to show up uh, at this thing. I have really no idea, but I know that I need it. I'm going to show up and. Lo and behold, <laughs> you know, I think seven people showed up. But seven people showed up. And that was the signal for me to say, actually, there's something here. And in that year of contacts for myself, OK, fine. But seven people showing up means that the contacts of, of what was happening in the workplace or around the workplace or in life also meant that other people needed that. And as a result of that, you know, I was able to start to champion bringing in some mental health providers. In fact, another great thing that we, we considered doing was to, to look at how do we get people to start talking so that they can deal with the stress. Because we didn't want people to burn out. I was burned out. And it took me to hit that rock bottom to realize it. I didn't want people to go there. So I brought in, uh, I think, two days worth of, of psychologists and created a very anonymous uh, way to sign up for people who wanted to maybe explore having a therapy session with a professional therapist. And I put the sign-ups up thinking, hmm, no one's going to sign up. But then I thought, seven people showed up to the, to the film screening and the, and the mental health talk. Let's see. And wouldn't you know that every session was filled? Every session that we offered for sign-up, one-to-one counseling, and therapy got filled. It meant that over the course of two days, you know, 10 to, to 15 people had therapy sessions in our workplace. And that's what I'm saying, go radical. Companies that want to create well-being culture should be thinking about how do they create these spaces where actually it, you know, if 81% of people are expecting that you know, in the workplace and, and, the, and the workplace to be responsible for it, then, then be the radical uh, employer that, that takes a chance and, and offers that on hand. Because if you have it in your medical benefit plan, great. But it still requires you know, your employees to take advantage of that. But if you put it in the space and environmentally influence people around you know, that this is a good thing, and again, we're changing the stigma and changing that narrative to an investment in your mental wealth, then you get a better reaction and you get a better result because people are going to you know, say, wow, this company really does care. And actually, I'm working through my crap and I'm getting through life's adversities and I'm going to be all right. Interesting. I never expected that we would have that kind of turnout. And that's what really got the ball rolling for me in well-being. So imagine in, in so many companies, the issue is so much bigger than people think. And I think what you did it's, a, it's an incredible uh, way of just helping people confidentially. Yeah. And so I really, really, really love that. So now if we go, like, imagine for uh, leaders in their company, what are the steps that they can take in order to create a strategy for well-being? I think we start at the top. You start with the C-suite, you start with the CEO, you start with the president and the leaders of the business. When we start there, then we're signaling that this is important. This is a priority. And when we start there and we start to introduce the ecosphere of practices, you know, in our, my current company at The Body Shop, we practice mind, body, and soul. Okay? This language exists. But when you have clear pillars, when you create an ecosphere and practice of culture. And it comes from the top. And the top is saying, we're doing this. And the top is also you know, 
in an, in an appropriate way, modeling and or sharing and being vulnerable in those spaces, you know, they're not trained psychologists either, okay? But they can certainly role model and create space for well-being or mindfulness or present uh, moments for, for employees so that we're actually demonstrating that duty of care and creating culture. I say start there. And when you start there, as I mentioned when we did some of our, our training, I had every executive across the, the C-suite then co-sponsor one of those uh, trainings that we did for how to have the well-being conversation. Well, guess what? That was a great opportunity for those leaders to build relationship with people and people managers outside of their department, outside their function uh, of expertise, and demonstrate their own vulnerability and create a, a, a deeper connection with people, but also a deeper credibility of saying, actually, I find this important too. We need to do this together. The sense of togetherness when we talk about well-being in the workplace can be a real rally cry for empowering you know, a workplace to, to be progressive and to actually then drive better results. When happy people are you know, doing work, you're going to have bigger and better results. But if unhappy people are selling your product or you know, struggling you know, with whatever they are in the mental space or at the workplace, then they're not going to have that same kind of productivity. I think you start from the top. You create uh, an ecosphere of language. You create tools, simple tools, that people can remember. And put it out there so, and, and demonstrate it and role model it and make it happen. I'll give you a good example. On one of our global town halls, and this must have been in 2021, maybe 2020, during the pandemic here, I insisted, and I, I had the ear of, of our CEO, I said, I insist we need to have a mindful moment on the call. People are, are so scattered. They're isolated. They're not in the, the office connecting. You know, humans love to connect. We need to do something just to reground yeah. everyone. And I was able to do a mindful moment, semi-meditative, 700 of our employees on a conference call and took a time out just to reground people. And our, our, our leader said, let's do it. And that signaled on a global town hall where we're saying, we're talking about business, we're talking about these other things that are important, we're talking about how are we going to you know, be resilient to, to the adversities that we're facing through the pandemic, that actually we, we need to just stop for a minute and take a breath. I say often, and in my coaching sessions with leaders and, and, and managers, is pause and consider. Mm -hmm. If we're not pausing and considering for a moment, in that moment of, of reflection, then we're moving too fast. Yeah. You know, we can create shift. And I, I think you did a couple series on, you know, shift happens. Mm -hmm. Just like shit happens, mm -hmm. shift happens too. Mm -hmm. But what we have to do is create the space for our brains to actually move from the lower brain to the upper brain and process. Mm -hmm. When we do that then, we're creating a space for people to kind of come back and reground, get clear again. And it's also about simple things. You know, encouraging people to hydrate get regular sleep. We did a variety of, of well-being treatments and, and sessions and, and webinars on, on these topics. But when we start to create that, and it's signaled from the top, and then it's practiced in a, in a very huge way across the organization in, in that way and at that time, it, it makes a difference. Yeah. And that's what leaders need to, to be thinking about. Yeah. And I, love, and I think a, a lot of times it's not just about thinking about, I'm going to focus on well-being, so I'm going to give to someone in my team to, to, yeah. to, to, to have that project. I, I agree with you. It needs to be embodied by the top leaders. You know, it needs to be a part of their, of their way of, uh, of acting and, and being, and that's how it's going to repercute to the, to the rest of the, of the company. People were blown away. Uh, after that, yeah. after that town hall, I'm sure. Like we have never seen anything like that. Yeah. Well, you know, wow. Yeah. We're, we're, what are we saying here? We actually are living this value of, of yeah. taking care of people. We have a value called the joyful collective. That mm. was powerful. Yeah. So maybe you can give an example of a story from one of your companies or that you heard that a company that really got it right in terms of well-being. There's no one size fits all. What I think is important 
um, is that leaders are thinking about well-being as this birthplace, uh, as equal and as important to diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and equity. They all go together. When we think about that paradigm, and I think that that's a filter, a really great filter, what, what if we started to remake and reshift our companies to have, you know, instead of HR, uh, you know, equity leaders who, mm -hmm. through that lens of equity, mm -hmm. then think about diversity and inclusion and belonging and well-being, we'd, we'd have different workplaces in that space. Mm -hmm. So is there a company that does it really great? Um, there are a lot of companies doing really, really important things and moving and championing um, their competitive edge to create well-being in the workplaces. And then there are some that are very alarming that aren't doing anything. Um, they haven't thought about it yet. So, you know, I, I think as I go to these well-being conferences and I'm, and I'm listening, you know, there are some companies that do a great job um, at creating mental health first aiders or creating ambassadors around the, the business, you know, to champion the, the well-being mission and or to destigmatize mental health so that there's conversation around there. Even in my business, we had, you know, ambassadors around, around the world that we created. We created think tanks. Um, we had well-being ambassador think tank uh, for quite a number of seasons uh, to just make sure that we're all talking about it and that we're thinking about what can we do um, to get to the, the far reaches of, of our business. You know, retail businesses are, are spread out all over the world with lots of individual satellite stores and places that are, are remote. You know, it's easy to talk to people in, in the office or at the, you know, at the warehouse or in the distribution center, but how do you make sure that you're getting down to store managers or how do you get into the sales, sales management team that, you know, are, are off in Alaska or somewhere in, in South America? You know, it's, it's about creating the solutions um, that work and that are appropriate uh, for, for your business. And, and again, not a one size fits all, but try some stuff out. Like I said, be yeah. radical, see what works. Yeah. If it works, then do that. You know, <laughs> if it's not working, you know, try something else. You know, I think it's really important to, to think about how you innovate in this space and send some people to some conferences. Um, name a, you know, a chief well-being officer. Put someone in charge of thinking about this so that it becomes a, a muscle that you develop and grow. Hmm. What is the smallest thing that a leader can do in order to, to start the journey on, on well-being? The smallest thing that a leader or manager can do is listen and hold that space mm. for their employee. I, I mean, in my book, I talk about self-advocacy. You know, I talk about the trifecta of self-love. Okay? The trifecta of self-love is self-care, self-compassion, and self-advocacy. Employees and, and, and people need to self-advocate for themselves, right? You need to raise your hand and say, hey boss, or hey leader, or hey supervisor, or hey coworker, I need this. Yeah. What we need leaders and managers to do is to also advocate mm. space and time and energy mm. for, that, for that dialogue. So I think it starts as simple as that. Hmm. Wow, so much value in what you, you said, uh, but I also know that you've been putting a lot of effort into writing a book and you came up with a framework. Can you share with us that framework and how it helps with help being at work? Yeah. Um, Your Real Life is the title of the book and we've talked a little bit about the components. The book itself is really about how to take authenticity and resilience and in combination make that a, a magic power to lean into life's adverse moments and challenges. Um, and as a result and byproduct of leaning in and, and getting through those challenges, bouncing beyond to live a life full of well-being and joy. Reality is a big part of, of the model. Resilient people know how to, to face in and lean into reality and move through the reality curve. Mm. They know how to channel energy mm -hmm. in the right way and they, they're thinking about their well-being energy batteries. You know, we've got four beautiful well-being batteries. If we don't think about those, it'd be really hard to get through the crap that we have mm -hmm. to deal with in life. Uh, and really authenticity is about knowing who you are and showing up from your inside out and then using the outside parts of the world to reflect and, and become even stronger through purpose. We talked about purpose earlier. And love is the last anchor of, of the real model. And it's, love really is about self-forgiveness. It's about creating community. It's about language and communication and saying hard things. And also it's about humor and having a little bit of fun. 
you know, resilient people and authentic people generally enjoy, you know, having a little bit of a laugh. Yeah. So I think when we put this combination of tools together, it really enables people to, to live through the hard parts of life. Because as I said, change is constant. And I thought, how do I want to help people get through the hard parts of life? This is a tool that enables that. Mm, wow, it looks very interesting. Yeah. Good. So we're coming to the end, and I have one last question. So people ask you a lot of questions, but what is one question that people don't ask you often and you would love to answer? <laughs> <laughs> I think people are like, why did you write a book? Um, I, wrote a, I wrote the book not only as a, a personal challenge for myself, but really as a way to build a tool set for people and, and give that gift. I, I hate seeing people suffer in life. And having been at that place where I was suffering and been at, at low moments in my career or in my life, you know, what were, the, what were those tools that helped me? I wanted to put a tool together that was not only effective for me and people that I've worked with across many 25 years of HR and, and coaching clients that was backed with the science to say this stuff works and when you get real and when you follow some of these tools and ideas and suggestions you can have a beautiful life of well-being and joy and that's what I want for people. My mission is to bring authenticity and resilience to others and help them build the skills so they can have a beautiful life. Full stop. That's what the book is for. That's what I want for the book and that's what I want for everyone. That's powerful. <laughs> Good. All right, so we're coming to the end. Yep. I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. I mean, thank you so much for sharing, I mean, your personal story, which can inspire more, uh, but also for, uh, for being a, a, an activist in such an important topic, which is well-being, which I think there's a long journey. So I'm happy that I'm amplifying your voice and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you. For Great the to be rest here. of your journey. Yeah, thank you very much. Really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>